Hey, thank you so much for checking out today's message. Our hope with this content is that it would help you come to know Jesus, follow Jesus, and lead others to do the same. If you're grateful for this word, be sure to hit that like button, subscribe to our channel, and also you can partner with what Jesus is doing here at Elevate City through giving. There's a link below for that as well. Here's today's message. I can't wait for you to hear it. We are people of a book. What we talk about in here is not informed by experience or popular opinion or what we're comfortable with. What we talk about in here is informed by the word of God, amen? Amen. This is our first source. This is our final authority. This is the greatest love story that's ever been written. And the best part of it all is it's true, amen? Amen. Second Chronicles chapter 20, second Chronicles chapter 20. Go ahead and get there. Without a doubt, one of the most significant moments that has happened over the last two years at Elevate City Church happened on December 21st, 2021, when we got word after meeting at the Marriott Hotel Room that we would no longer be able to meet there come the new year. And we got that word on December 21st, and I don't know if you know this or not, but December 24th is a pretty big day in church world. (laughs) Christmas Eve is like the Super Bowl for Christians, all right? So it's like my one chance to really shine and I get a really bad report right before that. And so um, we go into the beginning of January and I get to show the Marriott management what I like to refer to as the unsaved side of Joey McLaughlin. And uh, they let us meet there on January the 9th. And on January the 9th, I preach a message from 2 Chronicles chapter 20 titled, When We Don't Know What to Do, We Put Our Eyes on You. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And in that moment, I called our church not to 21 days, Joe, you sold us short, bro, to 22 days of fasting, okay? And it was a sun up to sundown. How many of you were here for 22 days of fasting? Come on. You guys remember those, those mornings where you would wake up at like 4 a.m. and you'd just be like gouging your stomach, just filling yourself up. You'd stay up late, drink a protein shake at like midnight just to get through the next day. But sun up to sundown, I think something like 350 people tapped in with us on that journey and fasted and prayed sun up to sundown. And it was in that season that God opened up this space and that we moved from a movie theater to a Marriott and then we moved into First Baptist Church, Sandy Springs. Can we make some noise for the generosity of First Baptist Church, Sandy Springs? Man, the people that we've met because we came here, the relationships that have been built, the families that have become family, the stories that have been written, the new people that have come, the faith that has been built, the lessons that it's taught us, the baptisms that we've seen. Uh, It's really beyond words what God has done in such a short amount of time here. And I really believe that the best is yet to come, that we ain't seen nothing yet. And um, if I could be honest, that, that statement is so good. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. But tonight I wanna take it a step further. We do know what to do and still our eyes are on you, right? No matter what, in every season, in every circumstance, on every mountain and in every valley, our eyes are on you. I don't want that to just be a message for a season. I want that to be the cry of a generation that no matter what, our eyes are fixed on Jesus in year two and in year 12 and in year 22 and 32 and 52 when Haddon Crew becomes the pastor of Elevate City Church that our eyes remain fixed on Jesus, amen? Some of you guys are like, who's Haddon Crew? It's my son, he's two, okay, he's two years old. And I'm just prophetically speaking that into his life, whether he likes it or not. And uh, it's really funny actually, when you think about it, Haddon was born uh, a a week after we launched Elevate City. We launched on October 4th, 2020. Haddon was born on October 11th, 2020. And uh, so it's so beautiful to kind of watch the journey of him growing up and our church growing up at the same time. Because you see this little baby who like, you know, he comes out and like, I remember back on October 4th, 2020, it's like all our church did is pretty much what a baby did. It like cried and slept and pooped, right? (laughs) But now you start to see two years in and little hat and he's taking steps and he's speaking words and he's growing up. And I feel that same thing happening in this house, amen. 
that we're taking steps and we're speaking words and we're starting to grow up in a really beautiful way. But I pray that the one thing that's true every step of the way is that our eyes stay fixed on Jesus. Let me remind you of this story, 2 Chronicles chapter 20. We'll pick it up in verse 1. After this, the Moabites and Ammonites and with them some of the Meunites came against Jehoshaphat for battle. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a great multitude is coming against you from Edom, from beyond the sea. And behold, they are in Hazan Tamar, that is in Jedi. Then Jehoshaphat was afraid and set his face to seek the Lord. And he proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. From all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. That's the reason that we gather week in and week out. If you're ever wondering why do we Sabbath, why do we prioritize church attendance, why do we set up and tear down, why will we go from movie theaters to Marriott's to old churches, because we are coming to seek the Lord. We believe that what is found in his presence is more precious than life. It is more than a TED talk. It is more than a concert. It is the spirit of God on the move, causing life to come into dry souls and dead bones, making dead things come to life, speaking the word of, of truth that is everlasting to everlasting. We come to seek the Lord. We don't come to hear a speaker or a band. We come to seek the Lord. Amen. Amen. Praying that when we gather here, that we find him, that we meet with him, that we have an encounter with him. You can hear a lot of great talks and a lot of great messages, but a touch of his presence will change you forever. Yeah. And so we come to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God, our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms and all the nations and in your hand are powers and might so that none is able to withstand you. And did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before the people of Israel and give it to forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? And they have lived in it and have built for you in it a sanctuary for your name. That's what this is. It is a sanctuary for the name of Jesus to be elevated, for the name of Jesus to be adored and worshiped and gazed upon, for the name of Jesus to speak things in power and see impossible realities come to life, for the name of Jesus to be high and lifted up so that people can know the healing and the power that is only found in his name. If disaster comes upon us, the sword, a judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this house and before you, for your name is in this house. And we will cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. And now behold the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came from the land of Egypt, and whom they avoided and did not destroy. Behold, they reward us by driving us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. O oh, our God. Will you not execute judgment on them? For we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Let me hear you say it. Our eyes are on you. One more time. Our eyes are on you. You know, thinking about the last two years and thinking about this last year in particular and thinking about this passage of scripture, I've been thinking a lot about seeing. And I've been thinking about a a lot about faith. I've been thinking a lot about eyes. And I actually, I know you guys know that I got so jacked up on the Holy Spirit recently that I've just studied so much about the Holy Spirit and it's just wrecked me. I, I kind of had a similar pursuit with eyes. I started to study eyes so much that for a brief second, I thought about leaving behind my call to ministry and becoming an optometrist, okay? But then I looked it up on ZipRecruiter and they don't make as much as you thought that they would, okay? So I think I'm gonna ride this preaching thing out for now. But I started to look at eyes, and um, let me tell you some really interesting things that I learned about eyes. I don't know if you know this or not. Did you know that the only organ more complex than the eye is the brain? The eye is unbelievably complex. Did you know that the optic nerve contains more than one million nerve cells? Your eyes can distinguish approximately 10 million different colors. Unless your name is Jake, because that dude's colorblind. I don't know if y'all know that or not. If you're ever wondering why Jake wears black every week, it's not a fashion statement. It's because he's colorblind, okay? We let him pick out colors. Sometimes it doesn't go well, all right? If the human eye was a digital camera, it would have 576 megapixels. 
A lot of you are like, that's interesting. What does that mean? Well, for point of reference, the iPhone 13 has 12 megapixels. Only one sixth of your eyeball is actually visible. Your fingerprint has 40 unique characteristics. Your iris has 256. The average person blinks 12 times a minute. And I bet at least 12 of you just blinked in that moment right there. I don't know if you know this or not. I found this especially interesting that the space between your eyebrows right here, it's called your glabella. It's called your glabella. That has no spiritual implications. I just wanted you to know that. And a little bit of just dating tip for all of our single guys in the house. If you want to get a date, shave your glabella, okay? <laughs> Trim that thing up. You'll thank me later. One of the most co common cosmetic injuries is the poking of the eyeball with a mascara wand and all the women said amen. <laughs> Statistically, it happens 99% of the time while driving. <laughs> I just made that statistic up based upon my wife's experience. <laughs> I found this so interesting. Scientists know that the function of tears is to keep the eyes clean. This is very interesting. However, scientists don't understand why we cry when we get emotional. There's no scientific explanation for it. So interesting. But here's what I found absolutely stunning and mind-blowing and unbelievably compelling in all of my nerdy research on eyes. And it's this, it's that 80% of all learning and memory comes through the eyes. 80%, I hope that didn't fall on deaf eyes tonight. 80% of all learning and memory comes through eyes. Most of what we learn comes by way of what we see. So inevitably, the things that we put our eyes on determine the direction of our life. What we see influences the state of our soul. What we set our attention on determines our direction. Scriptures know that this is true. David in Psalm 101 verse three says, I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. He's got this eager pursuit and this is after his interaction with Bathsheba, which many of us know that he's famous for. From that point in his life, he goes, I will not set my eyes before anything that is worthless. Job in Job 31 makes a covenant with his eyes. He makes this promise with his eyes to not look at anything that he shouldn't. The apostle Paul, before he is baptized in Acts chapter nine, verse 18, has something like scales fall from his eyes as he regains his sight. And then he prays in Ephesians 1:17 that you would have the eyes of your hearts opened that you may know the hope to which he has called you. And Jesus so famously in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter six, verse 22, says the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. What we put our eyes upon becomes the vision that we have for our lives. Now, according to uh, one study, the average American looks at their phone 344 times a day. That's once every four minutes. If you factor in eight hours of sleep, it's once every two and a half minutes that we are looking at our phones. Do you know one of the biggest lessons that I've learned over the last two years they're trying to launch a church in the middle of a pandemic after hearing all of the reasons why we shouldn't, after hearing no, after no, after standing in the face of great obstacles and great opposition. Do you know one of the things that I've learned is that the more that you look at something and the more that you magnify a situation, 
The more that you set your gaze upon a circumstance, the bigger that circumstance becomes. The more that you look at the reasons not to, the more that you look at the opposition that is standing against, the more that you look at the battle that's in front of you, the bigger the battle becomes. But the more that you gaze upon Jesus, the more that you set your eyes upon him, the more your soul begins to magnify, the more your peace begins to grow, the more your confidence begins to build within your soul because you know that greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. That he who has gone before us is greater than whatever would stand in front of us. What are your eyes on tonight? Because I want you to know that if your eyes, which many of your eyes are, if your eyes are on the news, all you're gonna see is fear. And if your eyes are on your phone, all you're gonna see is anxiety. And if your eyes are on the stock market, all you're going to see is worry. And if your eyes are on the battle, then all you're going to see is defeat. But if you will get your eyes on him, then nothing is impossible. There are limitless possibilities because we serve an unstoppable God. What are your eyes really on tonight? What do you spend most of your time giving your attention to? What do you spend most of your time gazing on? Let me ask it like this. What are you holding your magnifying glass up to tonight? I, I thought about bringing a magnifying glass out on stage, but I brought a pot out on stage for my last sermon and like two props in a week is too much for Joey McLaughlin, okay? But let me ask you, what are you holding your magnifying glass up to tonight? Because the truth about a magnifying glass, if you'll remember, it doesn't make an object any bigger. It just changes the perspective of that object. And so as you hold a magnifying glass, as you take your focus and you look at whatever it is that you're going through and whatever obstacle is standing in front of you and whatever lie the enemy has told you, then that's going to, it's going to get bigger in your perspective. The truth is, is God can't get any bigger than he already is. He can't get any bigger. He has no need for a workout plan. He doesn't need any gains. He doesn't need to take a protein shake or put on any pounds. He's doing just fine. However, your perspective of how big he is, that needs to shift. That needs to change to know what he's really able to do, to know what he really can do, and to know what he's really willing to do. When we put our eyes on God, we see that the things that once looked terrifying, God is actually going to use for our building. You see, some people, all they see right now is destruction and disaster and defeat. You see yourself as being outnumbered and out-resourced and out of options. But if you'll remember the story, the place of the battle becomes the place of the blessing. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 25 says it like this. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take their spoil... They found among them in great numbers goods, clothing, and precious things which they took for themselves until they could carry no more. They were there three days and taking the spoil, it was so much. On the fourth day, they assembled in the valley of Barak, for they blessed the Lord. Therefore, the name of that place has been called the Valley of Barak to this day. Barak in the Hebrew means the place of the blessing, the place that they fought the battle which they didn't even have to fight the battle if you remember the story. The way that the story goes is God says, I want for you to send your worshipers out front. Let them begin to worship. And scholars tell us that the sound of the worship is so loud that these three opposing armies that were coming against the Hebrew people get confused and they begin to fight themselves. I love that, that they get so afraid of worship that the enemy begins to fight himself. And so they don't even have to lift a finger. God fights the battle for them. They come into this place where they were going to have to fight three armies and they have to spend three days picking up blessings. You see, we see a battle, God sees a place of blessing. We see an obstacle, God sees a place of growth and maturity and a way that he wants to build us up. Do not forsake the place of the battle because it may be your greatest place of blessing. God sees opportunity and pruning and breakthrough and transformation. He sees a refining fire if you will get your eye, to help you get your eyes off the things that are passing away and on the things that are eternal. Makes me think of Isaiah 43, 19. It 
See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not see it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. God, I've noticed over the last two years, it has not been an easy ride. It has felt like a roller coaster. Everybody sees nights like this and goes, that sounds awesome, let's do it. And, you know, I just plan a church, they say. It'll be fun, they say. Do it for the Lord, they say. People will come, they say. My mom told me I was very funny, she said, right? All these things that, are, okay, cool, it'll just be great, we'll just do it. But they don't tell you about the, the days that you sit with somebody and their marriage is falling apart. And they don't tell you about the people who say that they're going to be there for you and with you and ride it out, but that they end up leaving. They don't tell you that you're not going to be able to find a place to meet. They don't tell you how much it's going to cost. They don't tell you not how much it's just going to cost financially, but how much it's going to cost your family. They don't tell you how much it's going to cost your soul. They don't tell you how much time you're going to have to spend on your knees. They don't tell you how many tears you're going to cry. They don't tell you how many prayers you're going to pray for people who won't pray those same prayers for themselves. They don't tell you what it's like to want so badly or to see potential so greatly in something, someone, to see someone like start to get it and like walk away from that stupid, idiotic boy that just keeps pulling them back into this toxic, dysfunctional relationship. And they finally walk away and they're seeking the Lord and they're walking with the Lord and they're, they're leading and they're discipling. But then that stupid boy just comes and reels them back. And they don't tell you like what that's gonna do to your heart as like a pastor and as a friend and as a disciple maker. They don't tell you what it's like to wake up at 4 a.m. with just this longing for more people to be able to experience the freedom of Jesus. They don't tell you what it's like to like fall in love with like the word so deeply because you're preaching it week in and week out that you're like learning stuff about the Bible that you had just like passed over and then you're like having to lead your church on this wild adventure of following the Holy Spirit and you're like everybody's gonna think I'm weird now I wasn't supposed to be the weird one <laughs> and nobody tells you what that's like nobody tells you and and I know that there's probably a moment where you're you've got these mixed emotions and I just want you to know that whatever great thing God calls you to, the difficulties are going to be worth it so long as your eyes stay on him. And your eyes don't stay on the results, but you trust him with the results. And you let him be enough. You know, as we've been studying the Holy Spirit, um, it's just been wrecking my soul, as many of you know. And uh, one of the images that we see for the Holy Spirit throughout scripture is a dove. And we see it um, in multiple different places. We see it um, in the story of Noah where he sends out a dove and a dove is able to find uh, dry ground. And it's actually this echo of Genesis. It's really beautiful. I don't have time to get into it tonight. But then we also, we see it in, in um, Jesus' baptism where a, a, the Holy Spirit, like a dove, descends and it rests upon Jesus. And um, something really interesting about dove, doves that I found out is uh, that doves don't have peripheral vision. So they lack the ability to see from one side to the other when they lock in on a target. When a dove locks in on their prey, they go at that prey and they can't see anything but their prey. Their eyes get set on that prey. And that is precisely what the Holy Spirit wants to do for you and me. The Holy Spirit, his role in our life is to get our eyes laser focused on the person of Jesus, to get blinders on so that we see nothing but Jesus, so that our focus is on Jesus, so that our gaze is at Jesus. It's just like Hebrews chapter 12, verse one. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I think that my whole point of my message tonight is to try to get you to keep your eyes on Jesus, is to try to tell you, just keep staring at Jesus. Keep looking at Jesus. Keep making space and time for Jesus. Keep sitting with Jesus because he is the holy one. He is the excellent one. He is the worthy one. He is the one that your heart desires. He is the one who can make all things new. He is the one who turns seas into sidewalks. So just keep looking at Jesus. Don't look at your circumstance. Don't look at your situation. Don't look at the news. 
Don't look at popular opinion. Don't look at what's happening in culture. Just get your Holy Spirit blinders on. Put some guardrails up and just say, I'm going to keep my eyes dead focused on Jesus because he's my only way out. He's my only way through, and he's the only one that's going to matter in the end. You know, I got really interested not in just what I could find on the interwebs about eyes, but I got really interested in what I could find in the Bible about eyes. And uh, I found this to be so interesting tonight. And I want to close with this. I want to show you the first mention of eyes in the Bible. And then I want to show you the last mention of eyes in the Bible. Genesis chapter 3 Verse four says this, but the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Eve saw that it was delightful to the eyes. You know, that same thing that happened in the garden all those years ago, echoes into humanity to this very day. You and I have this great propensity of setting our eyes on things that look really good, but that are not for our good. That when we look at, they look like they are going to bring life. If I focus on that, and if I get that, and if I eat that, and if I taste that, and if I give myself to that, then it's going to be good for me. But the lie of the enemy that sabotaged Eve is still sabotaging you and me. That what our eyes can see in creation will never be as beautiful and as glorious as the creator. And that when we set our eyes on this creation and we lose sight of the creator, everything starts falling apart. Do you see what happens when she gives in to what her eyes want? Sin enters the world. She sees that there is nakedness and shame and brokenness. And this has likely been many of your experience. You've set your eyes on what the world told you you should get and you've gotten it. You got the degree and you got the job and you got the car and you got the house and you got the spouse and it's still not enough. Because the only thing that can, desire, that can fulfill the desire of the human heart is beyond what you can see in the flesh. You've got to see it through faith. You've got to see that it's the God who created all of this is ultimately what your heart is looking for and longing for. But do you know what the good news of the gospel is? Is that although what our eyes did and what our eyes pursued and what our eyes gazed upon and got produced brokenness and sin and shame, there is a good God who would not leave us in that place. Flip to the end of the Bible and we see the last place that eyes are mentioned in the Bible is Revelation chapter 21 verse 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. The first mention of eyes in the Bible is the fall. The last mention of eyes in the Bible is God fixing the fall. I can tell you why scientists don't know why we cry when we're emotional. And it's because we were never supposed to. God didn't design it that way or make it that way. He made it so that we would gaze upon him and see that he meets all of our needs that he satisfies every desire of the human heart, that he is what is beautiful. And so I'm just telling you tonight, fix your eyes on Jesus, look full in his wonderful face and watch as the things of this earth become strangely dim in light of his glory and grace. Let's pray together. Jesus, I know that there's some people here tonight who have probably had their eyes on a hundred million different things. They've been believing that what they 
have been looking at could produce life. And I just pray that tonight they would know that you are the author of life. If tonight you find yourself in that place of looking to things to give you life other than Jesus and and knowing tonight that you know, that you know, that you know that they can't and that he is what you're looking for, then I wanna give you an opportunity to respond to that tonight with every head bowed and every eye closed. If you just wanna turn your eyes upon Jesus tonight, if you wanna give your life to Jesus tonight, let me tell you this story. There's a good God who loved you, who created everything, but there's this big problem and it's called sin and it broke off relationship with God. There's beautiful hope, Jesus came to give up his life, to die on a cross and to rise again from the dead, to pay for your sin, to get you back home to the heart of God. There's a response, turn your eyes upon Jesus, surrender to Jesus, give your life to Jesus. And if you wanna do that tonight, just pray with me. Jesus, I need you. I know I've sinned and fallen short but I believe that you died on the cross to pay for my sin. I believe you rose again from the dead and defeat, from, from the grave and defeated death. I give my life to follow you tonight. Tonight, I turn my eyes upon Jesus. If you prayed that prayer, then we just wanna celebrate with you tonight. Every head bowed and every eye closed. On the count of three, I'm gonna invite you to raise your hand so that we can celebrate with all of heaven that you've seen Jesus tonight. One, two, three. Come on, hands already up. Amen. 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 Let's celebrate people being Jesus tonight.